All right, so you know where Egypt is. This uh, map is not wonderful, but it's the best thing I could come up with to short, uh, show the whole region. So right there, the Mediterranean Sea, and right on the right-hand side of it, uh, on the eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea, is what eventually will become Israel, the Promised Land. The most powerful civilization that was contiguous to Israel was always Egypt. There were a variety of other, of course, important powers in the ancient world. Most of them were more distant. Egypt was always right on the doorstep. Sometimes that was good, sometimes it was not so good, but it always made Egypt kind of a perennial factor. And so when we think about Egypt, we're thinking about really the closest powerful neighbor to the people of Israel throughout their history. And it all begins as we find Abram now making this journey to Canaan. If we think about the other points of the compass with respect to what eventually will become Israel, it's now Canaan, you look off, of course, to the west, you've got the Mediterranean Sea, so there's no great threat there, and Israel never had much of a seaport, so there was never, it was kind of a rocky coast, in other words, so there was never a time when there was immediate threat from the sea. To the north are the nations of Syria and Phoenicia, and while they certainly represented important neighbors, they never were colossal powers. Syria was never an empire. Assyria was, but not Syria. Phoenicia was important because of their sea trade, and they had a lot of money and a lot of influence, but again, they were never a great military power. And so those immediate neighbors to the north don't represent the kind of presence that Egypt did. Further to the north, you have what we'd call Turkey. It's called Anatolia. The most important empire there was known as the Hittites. The Hittites, of course, show up, don't they? We hear of the Hittites, Uriah the Hittite, for example, and others who show up. They were an important empire, at times actually competitive with the power of Egypt, but they never seemed to have been any immediate threat to the people of Israel. For some, whatever reasons, they just don't seem to have taken much interest or otherwise been much of a factor, but we'll look at the Hittites in a few weeks at least briefly. Off to the east we have Mesopotamia, but the immediate east of Israel is the Arabian Desert. Nobody could live there, very few people did, and again there was no immediate threat there. So what I'm saying is that of all of the neighbors of Israel, the one great power that was constantly part of the story was Egypt down to the south, to the west, and that of course is what we're going to be thinking about today. This is probably going to be more than you ever wanted to know about Egypt, but work with me. We are going to get to some great Bible stories eventually, but it'll help us to do a little bit of this background, and this is, after all, historical context of the Bible, so just bear with me as we go through a little of this ancient historical background that I hope you'll find somewhat interesting. Ancient Egypt is the longest lasting civilization in history. If you're ever on Jeopardy, and that question comes up, then this is the correct answer. The longest lasting civilization, a constant persisting civilization, sometimes doing well, sometimes not so well, but always there. There was never a great interruption. It was always there in some form or other, beginning around the year 3000 with the earliest pharaoh who united all of Egypt and ending with the last pharaoh in about the year 30, whose name was the last pharaoh. Her, na her name was Cleopatra, otherwise known as Elizabeth Taylor. But <clears throat> and you see, you laugh because you're old, you know? <clears throat> when I say that at school, to high school, they go, Elizabeth who? So we are all in the same generation, aren't we? We appreciate that. But anyway, that is the last pharaoh of Egypt. And so for some 3,000 years, you have then an ongoing, persisting governance of Egypt by virtue of this line of pharaohs. There's about 30 dynasties all connecting together to make up the long history of Egypt. It starts, as I say, around the year 3000 BC. It continues all the way down to the time of Rome. Of course, the defeat of Cleopatra and Mark Antony by 
Um, Octavian, who would become Augustus Caesar in 31 at the Battle of Actium, was the point where Egypt was, in a sense, swallowed up by Rome. And we would say that was the great interruption to Ro Egypt being its own kind of self-sustaining civilization. So we're saying for 3,000 years or so, it was able to pull that off, and that's a record. The dynasties themselves were enumerated by a priest scholar whose name was Manetho, M-A-N-E-T-H-O. The only record we have of his writings is in the Jewish historian Josephus. And Josephus quotes Manetho and gives us these 30 dynasties and all of the pharaohs who make them up. We've independently confirmed a lot of that information by virtue of archaeological investigation and so on, but nevertheless the best intact rehearsal of those is from this character Manetho, who was a priest of the Egyptian world and was writing toward the end of this era. Herodotus, the Greek historian, sometimes called the father of history, he's the first really detached historian. He's a lot of fun. He's kind of a rollicking, anecdotal sort of historian, and he is the first one who gives us what you'd call non-heavily biased history. It's not spin. It's not kind of propaganda. It's just an attempt to give the, the story. He's writing about 400, and he has a little nickname for Egypt. He calls it the Gift of the Nile, and the reason for that is because were there no Nile River, there would be no Egypt that the only reason that there can be a civilization here is because that Nile River that begins with many tributaries in Africa and gradually grows and so on eventually becomes this major waterway as it is to this day. And so if you look at a map of Egypt, of course, you immediately are struck with the fact that the Nile River cuts right down through the middle of it and represents this great lifeline and that is in many ways the reason that the civilization of Egypt could sustain itself for as long as it did. The reason that Egypt did, uh, depended so much on the Nile and did so well because of it was because the Nile would create this vast floodplain. And so the green on this little sketch you have here is intended to show that every spring the waters of the Nile would overflow their banks and spread out across a pretty wide swath, watering this region and making it you know, possible to grow crops there. Egypt gets virtually no rainfall, but because of this yearly phenomenon, the overflowing of the banks of the Nile, it could nevertheless continue to produce crops. And therefore, in the ancient world, it was very common for people in times of famine to go to Egypt. And we're not surprised when we hear in the story of, Na of Abraham that we just read that when a famine hit up in Canaan, where there was no rain and there was certainly no Nile River, everybody starts migrating to a place where they can hopefully find food. Therefore, Egypt was sometimes called the breadbasket of the ancient world. And even down to Roman times, to control Egypt was considered to be a very important benefit because that's where you could always depend on grain. Even in famine times, ordinarily, the Nile would still supply this wonderful, rich flow of water, and the grain supplies would be uninterrupted. And so we find that, of course, with uh, Abraham. When's the next time that we find the people of God heading for Egypt in a time of famine? It's the story of Jacob and his sons and so on. We'll be looking at that next week. All right, so that's what's coming. When you think about the uh, topography of Egypt, it's been common in history to distinguish between what's called Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, and it's counterintuitive. Upper Egypt is toward the south, Lower Egypt is toward the nor north. You know, we sort of think it was just the opposite, but this is a measurement of the elevation, and so Upper Egypt was called Upper Egypt because it's a higher topography and the water tends to be running down toward Lower Egypt, which is the region of the Nile Delta and so on. So we have, uh, that's the basic uh, lay of the land here in Egypt. As you know, Egyptian uh, history is characterized by the rule of these characters that are called pharaohs. Pharaoh means great house, and it seems that the word was intended to connect the pharaoh to his dynasty, and even more than that, to a kind of semi-divine and in, at times completely divine understanding 
of who this person was. The Pharaoh had many responsibilities. Somewhere on the short list was controlling the entire universe. Would you like that for a job description? The Pharaoh was responsible for what was called ma'at, M-A apostrophe A-T, and that has to do with the regularity of the natural order. And so the Pharaoh was the person who was understood as controlling the flood of the Nile River, the rising of the sun, the production of the crops. How would you, know, how would you like to sleep at night knowing that? I, 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 I always wonder when I hear things like this, what did the Pharaoh think as he was going to bed at night? What do you do when that's your job to make sure that in two months the Nile will overflow its back? How do you do that? You know, and that was part of the way that the Pharaoh was understood by the Egyptian people, and the Pharaohs would do all they could to reinforce that image. So the people generally, especially early in Egyptian history, tended to view the Pharaoh as something of a god. And he had a kind of godlike quality that was part of the entire sort of uh, image that was connected with him. That's why it's very interesting when you read the story of the Exodus, you find God saying to Moses, I will make you as a god to Pharaoh and as a god to the Egyptian people and Aaron will be your prophet. And we read that and we think that's a little odd, isn't it? It almost sounds a little on the edge there. God saying he's going to make Moses a god? We think, whoa, that sounds like something that wouldn't sound very compatible with the Old Testament religion otherwise. But when we understand that that's exactly the way the Pharaoh portrayed himself to the people. And it became a kind of contest between two, as it were, gods, you see. Pharaoh, who held himself out as a god, who was in control of nature, now being bested by a god who comes and disrupts all of nature again and again in these plagues. And again and again we find Pharaoh, who's supposed to be the master of all of these, being completely overwhelmed by powers that are far beyond him. And so there's a kind of irony that's intended there in the Exodus story, which is based on some understanding that the Pharaoh held himself out as this kind of divine character. The history of Egypt is divided up between two different kinds of eras, and these are called by Egyptologists commonly a kingdom era and an intermediate era. Kingdom is the term that was used to refer to times when all of Egypt was under one common ruler, a kind of central authority governed it all. Intermediate periods represented times when the decentralized authority would uh, be taking place and you'd have uh, control in the north, upper e or control in the north, I should say, lower Egypt, and in the south, upper Egypt, and basically the control of Egypt was divided between those two. There are, in Egyptian history, commonly understood to be three kingdom periods. The old kingdom, the middle kingdom, and the new kingdom that begins with the 18th dynasty. Then there are intermediate periods that fall in between them, and so we'll see a little bit of that even today as we're going along. The garb that was worn by the pharaoh would reflect the authority the pharaoh enjoyed. So this was the so-called red crown. The red crown was worn by the pharaoh to indicate that the pharaoh controlled lower Egypt. And then there was another crown called the white crown, and that stood for the idea that the pharaoh controlled upper Egypt. And in intermediate periods, you'd have two pharaohs who would wear different crowns. But in kingdom periods, the two crowns would be combined, and so one pharaoh would wear them both. And it became this very lovely headdress that you'll sometimes see on pictures of pharaohs, in which it indicates that this particular ruler is now governing all of Egypt, both upper and lower, and that's why that little funny-looking hat was, uh, was worn. The pharaoh would also have two emblems of authority that he bore. One was called the crook and one was called the scepter. The crook is that kind of shepherd's crook thing that he's holding there that's uh, kind of on the right of the picture. It looks a little bit like a shepherd's staff, and that was exactly what it was intended to communicate. So the Pharaoh was saying to the Egyptian people, I am your shepherd. I am watching over, protecting you, caring for you as a shepherd figure, 
The scepter, on the other hand, had that funny little tassel at the end, and that stood for the authority of the pharaoh and kind of had the notion of his ability to wield great power. So the two together were the benevolent side of the pharaoh on the one hand, but the disciplinarian aspect of the pharaoh's authority on the other. Again, there's an interesting kind of correlation between this and Moses. You may recall that Moses performs a lot of his miracles by God's power using the instrument of his staff. When he's there at the burning bush, he takes his shepherd's staff, probably something like that crook there, throws it on the ground, it becomes a snake. The same staff is the one with which he hits the the uh, water and it divides, you know. The same staff is the one he held up when they were fighting the Amalekites. That staff plays a very prominent role and it has the same kind of function. It's a shepherd's staff and yet it also has this power, as it were, to perform miracles. So in a sense, the two devices there that Pharaoh has are combined somehow in the case of Moses. Another interesting parallel is in the 23rd Psalm, we find both of these referred to, the Lord is my shepherd, and so on. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. And the rod, of course, would be comparable to this rod kind of device, and the staff, the shepherd's staff, was something a shepherd would use, really, for the protection of his flock. So that was a fairly common ancient Near Eastern understanding that was found in Egypt, but beyond there, and we find little, at least, hints of that, even in the biblical text. Egyptian religion was largely polytheistic with a few notable exceptions. There occasionally came monotheistic pharaohs who stood out like a sore thumb against the backdrop of what was otherwise commonly a polytheistic religious outlook. Does anybody know the name, by the way, of the most famous monotheistic pharaoh in Egyptian history? Somebody might be an Egypt trivia buff. Anybody know? His name is Akhenaten. And he's a weird guy, really. We'll take a brief look at him in a week or two. But uh, he's, he's powerfully, viciously monotheistic. And it's very interesting that he comes along not too long after the Exodus, causing some people to wonder if his monotheism was, monotheism was an echo of the impact of the Exodus on the Egyptian psyche and this pharaoh is trying to adjust theology according to what seems to be some new understanding. That's highly speculative. I'm not convinced of it personally, but there have been some who've suggested that. For the most part, however, the polytheistic religion of Egypt involved these animal-shaped gods that come in a variety of shapes and sizes, and they represent, generally speaking, the natural order of things. They also worshiped the Red Sea because, of course, it was the lifeline of the Egyptians and so it was viewed as a kind of divine character. And there were others that had a sort of animal shape to them that were worshiped. This, again, becomes part of the backdrop for the Exodus story because if you know what, what goes on there, many of the plagues, not all of them, but many of them, in a sense, appear to be poking fun at the Egyptian gods, you know. What is the first plague, for example, that takes place in the Exodus story? The first plague is, come on, you, you folks that were in Exodus last, you were supposed to remember this, remember that? You've all, it's all there. What was the first plague? It turned the, uh, turned the uh, Nile River into blood. Here's the lifeline of the Egyptians. They virtually worship the Nile, and all of a sudden the Nile seems to be attacking them. It's the source of life, and yet now it becomes the stench of death. And right off the bat, their first god is failing them, and in fact, it appears to be attacking them, you know. The second plague is frogs. Very good. Because you know that when the water turns to blood or any kind of whatever it turned into, it was either blood or a blood-appearing kind of... Um, substance there, fish die. But frogs, they're smarter, they're amphibians, they just hop out of the, of the Nile. And so the text actually says they, the frogs came out of the Nile. I don't blame them, you know. And they head into the land of Egypt, escaping the Nile. What's interesting is the Egyptians had a frog god 
And so now it's like the second of their deities is attacking them, you know. And they've got frogs in the stew, they've got frogs in the bed, they've got frogs here, frogs there. And this great parody on their idolatry is being sort of suggested then by that second plague. The next couple of plagues are insect plagues, you know. What's the natural predator of insects? Frogs. The frogs die. You know, this is kind of ecologic. With the death of the natural predator, in you get these kind of insect creatures. And one of the Egyptian gods was, in fact, a sort of beetle god that was sometimes portrayed in Egyptian uh, imagery and so on. This is kind of ugly, if you ask me, but uh, the, uh, the ruler was actually pictured as if he had a beetle for a head. This beetle is called Kefri, and it was worshipped. But of course, it may have been one of the plagues. One of the plagues is called flies, but some Old Testament scholars believe the word that's used for fly there is generic enough that it may actually refer to this particular beetle, and that may have been one of the plagues. The next couple of plagues, of course, become boils on humans and on animals. And of course, another of the Egyptian gods was the bull. This was something that was worshipped commonly. The apis bull, as it was called, was worshipped because of its power of fertility. And cattle generally were regarded as having a kind of semi-divine character. They didn't, they didn't treat them like sacred cows like you might find under Hinduism, uh, at least traditionally in India. But it was nevertheless an idea that was associated with this kind of cattle having a sort of divine or special or sacred status, and now we find the cattle are being destroyed by the plagues. My point in all of this is simply to say that those who've looked at the plagues closely see that it's almost as if God is poking fun at the expense of these Egyptian deities, and this polytheistic pantheon of deities is being put very much on the ropes by the Exodus account and the plagues especially that uh, come along. One of the most important deities of this pantheon in Egypt was called Re, R-E. And again, this particular image shows a pharaoh with a head of a falcon. Re was pictured often as a falcon, a bird. By the way, notice the headdress of the pharaoh there. It's wearing the two, the white and the red crown. You see, it's very common. But this particular image is meant to highlight the notion of Re as the sun god. And the pharaoh was probably understood as being closer to Re than any other of the gods of ancient Egypt. And so pharaoh was originally sometimes viewed as the embodiment of Re. Later on was called the son of Re. But there was this close connection somehow or other in the Egyptian understanding of things between the pharaoh and this falcon deity. There was a mythology connected with Re, such that the sun god, Re, would shine during the daytime and then go down into the nether world at night. And so some of the expressions or artistry that pictured this, such as this one, would show Re now on a kind of boat, a bark, in the nether world. And he's got two deities in front of and back of him. You see the falcon head there once again. But part of what's going on, part of the Egyptian mythology, was that every night, Re would go into the netherworld and fight a great battle with a snake god. And the snake god would try his best to prevent Re from making it to morning and rising again. So the Egyptians went to bed every night with a little anxiety. We sometimes talk kind of jovially, well, is the sun going to rise tomorrow, you know? And it's like one of those things that's just a given. We don't worry too much about it. They did worry about it because it was always possible that Ray might lose that wrestling match sometime and they'd wake up and there'd be no sun. And so this was part of the Pharaoh's duty. He was associated with Re, and when the sun rose in the morning, the Pharaoh himself had a very early morning kind of worship service in which he would stand out there, and as the sun rose, people were supposed to say, thank you, Pharaoh, that's great, you came through for us again. And the Pharaoh would happily take credit for that. That's why in the the Exodus story, we find that Moses occasionally would confront Pharaoh early in the morning, 
because Pharaoh would be out there once again doing his morning routine to get the sun to rise, and it was at that moment that Moses would come and confront him with threats of coming plagues and that sort of thing. It also may be behind the the, uh, description of the killing of the firstborn in Egypt, because you may remember it took place right at midnight, and midnight was the moment when this wrestling match was supposed to take place. And so the very fact that it's that that moment is chosen may have been at least in some measure another indication that Ray lost the battle and that the firstborn dying throughout Egypt was going to be some great evidence of the fact that this this great calamity represented a failure on the part of Ray. It also may be behind that plague of darkness when the sun will not shine. You see, all of that may have been poking fun, especially at this particular God. This remains somewhat speculative, but at least there's some indication of it. I think my favorite Egyptian goddess is named Nut, N-U-T. The Egyptians had a cosmology not unlike the Mesopotamians. They understood that there was a netherworld below them. There was a great dome sort of thing, what was called a firmament, an expanse above them. It was semi-solid. And for the Egyptians, that dome above them was actually the goddess Nut. And this is one very typical example of the artistry that depicted that. If you see what's going on, you see two legs on one end, uh, arms and head on the other, and a very long, strange body there. This gal did not have much of a figure, but she, uh, she was the one who stretched herself out and protected the world that was beneath her, largely the Egyptian world, and then above her, of course, are the stars, which would be, in a sense, visible through her. So you have this notion of a protective deity there that makes up the kind of outer reaches of the sky and so on. The legendary founder of Egypt, the first uniter of the Egyptian world, north and south, was a guy by the name of Narmer, N-A-R-M-E-R, This is very, very round numbers, sometime around 3,000. The earliest artifact that's been found in Egyptology is called the Narmar Palette. This is a picture of it. I don't know how well you can make it out there, but uh, if you can see that it's uh, kind of a picture of a guy with a mace in his hand, he's holding an enemy by the hair and he's about to club the guy. It's not a very pretty picture. There's up in the upper right uh, a, a bird that's uh, that's the falcon, god, ray, and so this whole thing is depicting then Narmer as the first uniter of ancient Egypt. This uh, particular palette uh, was discovered by British archaeologists in about 1897. It's now at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. It's a pretty good sized uh, piece of work. If you look at the uh, flip side of it, you'll notice on this side Narmer is wearing the white hat, And if you look at the other side, and you can barely see this, I apologize, in fact, you really can't see it, so just trust me. But in the upper left is another picture of Narmer, and he's wearing, in this case, the, uh, the red hat. So this seems to be an indication that this is the first pharaoh to unite rule over the entire land of Egypt, and it takes place about 3000 BC. That's the first dynasty. Second dynasty is when we begin to see evidence of these rather elaborate burial procedures, which begin in the second dynasty with the use of a burial facility called a mastaba. And this would be a typical example of it. A mastaba was uh, an above ground kind of flat uh, sort of structure and then down beneath it would be these burial chambers and you got to them by escalator. It's actually, it's an amazing thing. Just checking. And so uh, the, uh, the uh, burial chamber down below, these could become somewhat elaborate, uh, some, you know, with uh, tomb robbers, that kind of thing being a concern. Sometimes they would make this somewhat elaborate kind of defensive mechanism, so that was the basic structure. By the time we get to the third dynasty, we have somebody came up with the idea of stacking these mastabas so that rather than just having one flat structure, let's have half a dozen, each one built on the last one, and it becomes then the first evidence of what eventually will be a pyramid. This is a famous uh, sort of stepped pyramid, as it's called, by Dozier. It lives about the year 2600 BC. 
This is associated with the third dynasty. And then the fourth dynasty is the famous pyramid builders. Now this is 2500 BC, you see. This is, this is a lot of work being done at a very early period. This is well before the birth of Abraham. This is well back of you know, the, the times we've been looking at in other discussions. But here sometime around 2500 BC, our best estimate is that these three great pyramid builders, Khufu, Khafre, and Menkare, build these superstructures. How they did it remains a colossal mystery. Uh, the engineering that went into moving these multi-ton rocks to the top of this still defies uh, any explanation short of space aliens, so I'll just leave that to your uh, speculation. But uh, anyway, they're remarkable. I'm sure some of you have actually visited the pyramids up. Who's been to the, who's actually seen them? So a few of you have, and I'm sure it's uh, quite a sight. I never have, so all I've got to go on are photographs here. Well, it seems that Egypt kind of spent itself after this a uh, great building campaign and, and so on, because from this point on, for about 500 years, Egypt goes into something of a period of decline. We don't have any great pyramids being built. We don't have really much of anything going on. It actually becomes an intermediate period for a time, taking us down to about the year 1991. A new era begins with the 12th dynasty in the year 1991. Remember, Abraham was born 1951. So the rise of the 12th dynasty corresponds generally with the birth of Abraham and the beginnings of the story of uh, redemptive history in the Bible that we associate with him. But uh, this takes place about the beginning of the second millennium BC. One of king that came along that was fairly early in this dynasty was named Zenusret or Sesostris. You'll hear it either way. The second, he's in 1889. He does take another run at building a pyramid. But it was too much work to do all these big stones, and so he decided to try his luck with mud brick. And uh, that's the way it turned out. Um, it looked pretty good at the time, but of course, over the ages, mud brick doesn't have the same staying power as stones, and so we find that uh, that was really the best effort. The pharaoh that's of interest to us in terms of the story of Abraham is named Sinusret III, a successor to the one we just looked at. He reigns from 1878 to 1841. He's usually depicted as a very sober, serious guy that seems to have the weight of the world on his shoulders. He seems to have been a very thoughtful character. It's, uh, he's, he's not, he does do some military campaigns, but the general impression of him is that he was someone who took very seriously his responsibilities for the well-being of his people. He seems to have been a fairly decent guy, in other words, which was not true of all of the pharaohs that came along. He was certainly the most powerful of the 12th dynasty, and at least if our chronology is correct, it's, very, it's at least possible, I won't say it's probable, but this is as good a guess as any, that this may be the pharaoh that was visited by Abraham in the story that we just read. Senyusret was famous for quite a few different things. Probably the most famous residual effect of his building efforts was this mud brick fortification that's found in the southern part of Egypt, and it was defensive against Nubia, which lay to the south, or Ethiopia, and so that's still a site that can be visited to this day. All right, so this is Sinusret III. Like I say, we don't have a huge amount of data on him, but I'd like to assume that he's the character that's in mind in the story, and come back now briefly to this story that we have here of Abraham visiting Egypt, and at least some of the background to this story hopefully will be uh, based on what we've just been talking about. But uh, if you recall, we were just reading it, we have a famine in Canaan. And as was very common, people would head for Egypt in times of famine. That was precisely what happened, and so the story, at least in that sense, is completely compatible with what the normal practice was in the ancient world. As they were entering Egypt, Abraham says to his wife, Sarai, I've got an idea. <laughs> when the Egyptians see you, they're going to recognize your beauty. This was, in fact, also very consistent with what was known. The Egyptian pharaohs loved foreign women, and they were generally regarded as more beautiful. I'm not making any judgments at this point. I'm just saying that that's pretty much a well-established fact. I think partly because they were just seen as exotic. 
And so there was this expectation or fear that if someone that was a particularly attractive woman who was clearly foreign might make her way into the region of Egypt, that that might attract the attention of some of the upper officials in Egypt. And depending on who she was and what her status was, it might even reach the attention of the Pharaoh. It does suggest to us something I was mentioning to you the last week or so, that Abraham is not just a wandering Bedouin. He's not just a guy with a tent and a donkey, you know, who's showing up with two or three people. Abraham, the, the evidence of this biblically is that if, you know, if, if what the Bible is saying about him is taken seriously, he was a major sheik. He had several thousand people who were associated with him. He was viewed as some kind of political slash religious leader. And so when he shows up, it does get the attention of people who notice these kinds of things. And so for Abraham to show up with a very beautiful woman in his company, he had reason to fear, might reach to the attention of Pharaoh. Combine that with the fact that it was not unprecedented for Pharaohs to kill husbands and take wives. They did do that. Now the earliest, the earliest actual example of that is Ramses II, who is somewhat later. We don't have anything like that this early. But the precedent, at least, was later, and it may have been an earlier practice. So Abraham may not be completely off his rocker at this point to fear that Sarah may get the attention of the Pharaoh and that this may go poorly for him. And so when he says this to his wife, we can understand from a human point of view why he would do such a thing. Commentators, however, say, no, ain't going to fly. As much as we'd like to rehabilitate Abraham's image can't do it. You shouldn't have done this, Abraham. So he universally gets the critique of the commentators. So here they go, they arrive in Egypt, and sure enough, she is noticed, and a report is given to Pharaoh concerning Sarai, and she is taken into the harem. We're given to understand from the text there was never, never any intimacy between Pharaoh and uh, Sarai. She was probably kind of there and waiting, you know, her turn sort of thing. These, ph these uh, pharaohs tended to have huge harems, and so uh, that would not be unexpected. It does seem to be that this was all consensual. It's not as if she was kidnapped or otherwise some sort of abusive you know, intrusive kind of thing. Apparently, it was a freely negotiated arrangement, and that would be consistent with the way these things would have been done. We certainly see the evidence of a handsome bride price that's being paid by the Pharaoh. He gives Abraham all kinds of stuff, sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, and so on. And so the Pharaoh is very lavish, and at least the impression we have is that Abraham accepts all of that. I don't know how he felt about it when he went to bed that night. You just have to wonder, don't you? But nevertheless, it does seem to be that uh, this was not some kind of coercive arrangement, and Abraham does uh, agree to it. And he steps into the picture and afflicts Pharaoh and his house with great plagues. Many commentators see in this a little anticipation, a little harbinger of plagues that will come later. But in this case, the Pharaoh responds very differently from the Pharaoh that we read of in the Exodus account, doesn't he? This particular Pharaoh, as soon as he figures out what the score is, dresses down Abraham for his actions that were less than the integrity that he should have been exercising. All right, so those are my little three uh, Sunday school lessons and a little background on Egypt. As I said, next week we're going to move forward just a bit and really be looking at the Egypt. That was the place where Joseph himself, of course, traveled. He became the vizier of the Pharaoh and that whole story of the uh, uh, movement of God's people into Egypt is going to be our subject. Then.